Alleluia! Christ is risen. The Lord has risen indeed. Alleluia! This is the second week, second week of Easter, and you can probably notice two things. One is it's snowing, so it must be the middle of April in western New York, right? And two, uh, I'm here at the National Comedy Center, as you can see behind me. Now you may be wondering, why would Luke be at the National Comedy Center for church? What about the National Comedy Center says the second Sunday of Easter, Alleluia, Christ is risen? Well, there's a good answer to that. There's an ancient tradition in the church that goes way back to the early church fathers, to St. Augustine, to Origen, and right back to the second century, that the su second Sunday of Easter was a holy humor Sunday. The idea was, of course, that that God played a trick on the devil. He kind of pranked the devil by sending Jesus down to the grave. That God basically tricked the devil into freeing everybody. That Christ led on free all the captives that had been in hell. And hell had no power and death had no sting. And so that's kind of this joke that God had, this, this sense of divine humor. And so the second Sunday of Easter became a, a Sunday where we talked about the Easter laughter, the laughter of rejoicing and of joy. And so here on this second Sunday of Easter, I thought it appropriate to start in Jamestown's own National Comedy Center, a place that we can think about the humor of the moment. My kids asked me to make sure I started one of my patented dad jokes, so I'm gonna do just that. 101 jokes so bad, they're good. Dad jokes. All right, this one here is for you all. Why don't oysters share their pearls? Because they're shellfish. Obvious, of course. I'll, I'll spare you the rest. But there's some really great groaners in here. Anyway, this service will continue to lead us through the, the readings for this week, but also to dig us deeper into this question of how do we find humor in this moment where we're cloistered, where we're hidden away, we're wearing masks, and yet we're also rejoicing with the, the power of the resurrection to free us from all that binds us and holds us back. So, so glad you're with us. Join me as we um, open in a world of prayer. None of us likes to look foolish, but which is sillier? Chasing after the world and all its gaudy trinkets, which flatter our souls, or being a fool for Christ, imitating him in service to others, offering ourselves in love and joy to the world. Let us admit to God the foolish choices we make each and every day as we pray, saying, You, you know, know better, better than, than we do, amused God, God. What, what important people we believe we are. Believing we have to be serious all the time, we miss out on the joy of your creation. Choosing to feast on the pain of the world, we skip the picnic offered in paradise. Clinging to the despair which is our best friend, we ignore Jesus, who can bring us home to your heart. Forgive us, heart of joy, and make us open to the startling and upside-down ways in which you work. Fill us with Easter's laughter. Fill us with your healing joy. Fill us with the love poured into us through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And now let's offer a time for silent prayers. The Gospels tell us over and over again, of the joy which comes to us through Christ. When Jesus was around, lives were changed. The sick were healed. The sorrowful began to laugh with joy. The good news is that this joy is now given to us. Through, through the Holy Spirit, we are gifted with joy. We are sent forth to bring good news to the oppressed, to bring healing to the broken to anoint everyone with the oil of gladness. Thanks be to God, we are forgiven. Amen. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us pray. O glorious St. Thomas, your grief for Jesus was such that it would not let you believe he had risen unless you actually saw him and touched his wounds. 
but your love for Jesus was equally great, and it led you to give up your life for him. Pray for us that we may grieve for our sins, which were the cause of Christ's sufferings. Help us to spend ourselves in his service, and so earn the title of blessed, which Jesus applied to those who would believe in him without seeing him. Amen. Join the procession as we continue the service. join you. I've been thinking about a psalm, which is a really old prayer, kind of the original prayer book, what Jesus would have prayed, actually, when he was around, you know? And, and this bunker got me thinking of the first verse of the psalm. Protect me, O God, for I take refuge in you. I have said to the Holy One, you are my God, my good above all other. You know what? I want to take you on a journey through this song. So come on and we're going to take a walk. From the bunker to the beauty that is outside, this is what the psalmist writes. All my delight is upon the godly that are in the land, the helpers, the good people out there caring for one another upon those who are noble among the people, those who run after false gods. In our culture, maybe it's prestige or power or money or even certainty. They'll have their troubles multiplied. Their libations of blood I will not offer, their sacrifices to those false gods. Nor will I take the names of their gods upon my lips. Oh God, you are my portion and my cup. It is you who uphold my lot, like a warm mug on a cold day. My boundaries enclose a pleasant land. Indeed, I have a goodly heritage. I will bless you, O oh God, who gives me counsel. My heart teaches me night after night. <sighs> I have always set you before me, because you are my right hand, I shall not fall. My heart, therefore, is glad, and my spirit rejoices. My body also shall rest in hope. For you will not abandon me to the grave. Nope. And you will not let your Holy One see the pit. You will show me the path of life. In your presence there is a fullness of joy. And in your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Lesson 
is from the first letter of Peter. And I'd like to share it with you. I'm reading from a really old Bible that I've had for probably about 15 years now, and it's kind of beat up. You can tell I've had it a little while. And I've been thinking about that, too, in this moment, the way well, we might feel a little bit beat up. But there's so much going on, so much more going on inside, you know? There's a treasure. Here's what First Peter has to say. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you can rejoice, even if now for a little while you have to suffer various trials, maybe getting a little battered along the way, worn out, so that the genuineness of your faith being more precious than gold, that though perishable is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. For you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And this idea of even though you haven't seen him, you love him. And there's joy in that, even in the midst of, of hard times. Well, it makes me think of one of Jesus' friends, Thomas. Uh, but we'll hear about him later. Thomas was able to believe in the resurrection, resurrected Christ because he met him. He saw Jesus. But for us, not very many of us have visions, appearances of Jesus. So we see God and Jesus appearing through the lives of others. They show us who God is and who Jesus is. And all this has me thinking about special people in my life. I was thinking about, this is my uh, wedding photo album, and I was thinking of my grandma and grandpa, and I want to show you one of their pictures. And this is a picture of us laughing together, and grandpa had the best laugh. At his funeral, when we were all, the whole family was gathered together, we were all telling stories before the service, and the priest came out, and he said, is this a party or a funeral? And that's the way Grandpa would have wanted it. And, and Grandpa was one of the people that showed for me what Christian hope and Christian faith is in this quiet, joyful hope, in a life faithfully lived to his family, his commitments, to his faith, and laughing all the way. His life wasn't easy, but he established a family proverb. It's better to laugh than cry. And I think about him now and today. He's one of the ways that I met Jesus. And I wonder, who embodied Jesus for you? And how can you embody the love and laughter of Christ, the victory of Christ, even over death? for others. Halle, 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 luya. Halle, 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 luya. Halle, 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 luya. Halle, luya, halle, luya. And so it was that the early Christian church sprang into life through the glory of Easter. What are you talking about? Hello. 
I'm talking about the Bible stories that tell us that after Jesus rose from the dead, the first Christians gathered together as the perfect church. Isn't that how it happened? No. Uh, well? Let's read the gospel story. That should tell some of what happens next. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them. Peace be with you. After Jesus said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When Jesus had said this, he breathed on them. Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But Thomas still would not believe. Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and I can put my fingers in those marks in the nails in his hands, and I could put my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, Jesus' disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them. Peace be with you. Then Jesus spoke directly to Thomas. Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. My Lord and my God! Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. Not everyone believed the story right away. For some of them, it took a lot of convincing. But they did manage to get together in a tiny little church. Great story! And then they all lived long and prospered? Well, no, not quite. What happened? Well, people tried to follow Jesus and his teachings, but some failed. They tried to share, and sometimes they still failed. But somehow, God was in the midst of all of it. Not unlike today. It's a good thing God has a sense of humor. It strikes me that the disciples weren't the only people in locked rooms this week for fear of disruption. Many of us are trying to figure out how to work from home or how to um, continue to keep normalcy at home. And so we find ourselves locked behind doors for fear that our children may distract us during a video conference. We're locked because our dogs may need our attention when we are trying to communicate and, and do our work. And so here I am in my attic. Um, like many other folks, if you happen to watch late night television or even just the regular news, you've seen all kinds of unusual um, filming locations. Uh, I know many of the comedians have been broadcasting from their basements or their attics or even the kitchen table with children climbing all over them. This is a humorous and bewildering moment in which we find ourselves, much like the moment that the disciples found themselves in. They probably ha didn't find the humor initially until long after the fact, like we find the humor in things when we know where they were safe. They were still in that moment of worry and of anxiety. Perhaps like many of us are as well in this moment where we fear for this coronavirus that is shutting us all in behind locked doors. But I've always loved this story about Thomas, doubting Thomas, and I think he gets a bad rap. And I've preached about that before. But what I was struck by this year was that Thomas is called the twin. 
and we never hear about who his twin was. And I have to believe that the, the, the writer who wrote the Gospel of John calls him a twin on purpose. Because I think that you and I are the missing twin. So much of our lives call for us to doubt about how to make our way through the world. Is this virus really as dangerous as it seems? What is six feet between our, our, our neighbors? How are we to, to navigate this world? And so we, we probe and we want hard facts. We want to understand. We want to know what this all means. And yet, like Thomas, the question is, when we're confronted with the truth, what will we do? My hope is that this story is not a story of judgment, because I don't think it is. I think it's a story of new expanding horizons. It's a story uh, of resurrection power, of understanding new realities that were fur furthest from the mind before they came to the fore of the mind. And so I think that's what I'm, we're called to this, this day. We're called to be like Thomas. Not to doubt the authorities, not to, to look for hard facts per se, but to live our lives in such a way that opens up new vistas, to think differently about how we find ourselves. So in the midst of this scary moment, I invite you to think through all the things that you might be grateful for, all the things that you might find new opportunities for, even when we find ourselves limited in our captivity. I started off at the beginning of this service talking about this holy humor idea that, that uh, by taking Christ captive, Christ was able to free all the captives. We're in a moment of captivity of sorts, shackled in our homes, not able to leave. And I wonder if it isn't a moment of freedom as well, where we're freed from any of the obligations and the busynesses that kept us occupied. We have more time to think about who we are and, and what we're called to. And we have to find the humor in all that as well. For instance, about a year ago, a year ago or so, I was thinking about how I could make each Sunday, new and unique, uh, make it an event of sorts where there was a theme of the day and we brought in new and different people to contribute to that service. And it strikes me that that's the moment I find myself in. And I have to pause and be grateful for all the opportunities that the hardship of this pandemic is creating. Getting more and more people involved in our services by playing um, bit roles and leading worship in ways I'd never thought. I never thought that what I was hoping for would come to reality in this way. Spending hours editing together footage of all of you that you've shot at home wasn't what I imagined when I had hoped for a unique service with each week being a new event. And yet, as I chuckle, I'm also grateful. You're going to hear um, some other testimonials from people who are, who are grateful for the, the, perhaps the things they might also grumble about. And that strikes me, that's what this story is all about. Finding eyes of faith to see new realities, new realities of hope and of resurrection, even in our midst. So as you walk through this week, I invite you to take um, a moment to reflect on the humor, the hilarity, and also the, the seriousness of it all. And I invite you to um, perhaps take a picture of what you find funny in your life in this moment. And with holy humor, to make, send it to me, and maybe we'll find a way, or make a video of, of the things that you find humorous, and we'll find a way to share that with, with all of us. Thank you for being on this journey with me as we walk through these um, bewildering and hilarious moments uh, and uh, anxious moments and also um, maddening moments and moments where we, we cry um, out, of, out of fear and of, of isolation. Please know that you're all deeply in my hearts and in my, my mind and in my prayers. We'll see you soon, and now uh, I'll turn it over to many of, of you all to share your story about what you're grateful for as kind of our, our prayers of the people. Amen.
Jesus and his lessons has taught us many things that we have learned through life. Circumstances teach us lessons also. The circumstances of this, the uh, corona, coronavirus has taught us many things, I hope. Perhaps this is the time to make a list of five things that you're really grateful for, that you are thankful for, that, may, that maybe perhaps the coronavirus has taught you. Amen. Got the clear? Okay. Good. I am so thankful to God and full of gratitude that Wallace is in our lives. He is such a wonderful young man. Elizabeth and I love him to death. Everything about being a parent has been exactly as expected. So predictable. What could possibly go wrong? Um, Dad, could I get a tarantula and a tattoo on you? Honey? I have to say, I am truly grateful for everything I have in this life. My wife, who puts up with me, my children, who I adore completely. They are beyond phenomenal. My, my dogs, who feel the need they have to eat right now while we're in the middle of doing this. But one thing I'm thankful for, above everything else, is the fact that I have a home in which we can all stay and we can be protected from the bad elements, such as this wonderful snow we have falling outside on this Friday afternoon. It protects us from the rain with this nice solid roof. It gives us shelter from the heat and the cold. Honestly, I don't know if there's anything else I'd want to change in my house. I absolutely love it. What about that hole in my wall? I really hate home improvements. Hi, this is Dana and Lonnie, and we're here because Luke asked us to be. And we're here to celebrate the gift of the empty nest. When our three children, Caroline, Kyle, and Hannah, first left home, it was a hard transition for us. One of us perhaps more than the other. And now we've learned to adjust. Empty nesting has become quite nice. Quite. <laughs> Thank you all. God bless and be safe. Even though we can't go out and play, and it's not what we thought would happen, I'm really thankful for my family time because every night is game night. Who wants to play face 10 dice? <laughs>